after marriage to south so we oh, came that's great. To, we came to uh, Chen- uh, i think we first came to um, kerala and then we went up to Sh- um, ramashivaram was oh. that place um, kanyakumari indeed Okay, so you might you might have witnessed all the temperatures here, Kerala for its cold chillness <laughs> and Ramachandra <laughs> for. I was there hot. in twenty twenty nineteen. I was there in February and it was still hot there. Yeah, I know. You're right. Rakesh, we met in uh, INP Mumbai and we had yeah. uh, almost yeah. uh, one week there. Yeah, Shiva, I I still remember that um, yeah. those days. It was a wonderful. The first the group is still alive. We are uh, <laughs> messaging it now and then. Yeah, indeed. Because we are staying at home, and especially yeah. you know, for me, I'm not seeing my family, not going I out. I think Prem is like active, continuously. He's been sending messages. Yeah, I used he... to see that, but not uh, replying too much. All right. Okay. Well, yeah, he's a, he's a, he's really. How is your kids? They are fine. They are in uh, Jammu. Uh, my wife is, um, you know, she's an associate prof in. Uh, the central university of jammu so she is um, with the kids okay how's uh, how's your family shiva yeah they are fine right. two kids they are doing good great that's cool that's cool so everyone is in uh, tamil nadu vidya ma'am vidya ma'am yes sir yes sir uh, participants vara uh, aramstanga i think they are coming uh, sir has joined okay. alexa Okay. Is there we can, uh, or we'll wait for a few more minutes. Yeah, maybe uh, we've got four more minutes, sir. Uh, okay. Yeah. Around two, three, or two, five, we can start. I think uh, participants are entering, and YouTube also they are watching. Okay. Devashish is there now. I will take care. Okay, sir. Still, you are having uh, connections with NASA. You said well, yeah. some projects with NASA. Still, you are doing. Yeah, exactly. I was there in um, December this year, like last year. Okay. December and January, because we have a collaborative work on um, graphene nano, like carbon nanotube-based biosensors. Okay. Uh, for heart and... health. So we're we'll still uh, in touch with the with the group, and I sent some sensors for gas sensing. Okay. Um, so we're still in uh, in touch with them. And your company, you are uh, still uh, going on any yeah, products? Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> it started uh, just before a week from uh, the way you know the the time when everything shut down. So okay. we were expecting a huge amount of money as an invest investment, but okay. unfortunately, it's all delayed till um, you know because they until the labs opens, there is no guarantee that the work will start. Okay. But so you look forward for some collaboration with our department, sir. Sure, sure. Um, I will be happy to, um, you know, connect with everyone um, working on a common platform. Well, there's a part Actually, of our, the... our department is like a mix of combination. Uh, we have biomedical background people and as well as uh, sensor background people. So That's we great. work on uh, in tandem with them. Sure, sure. Well, I think I'm always welcoming everyone um, who wants to work on uh, um, collaborative projects, and every whatever resources we do have here in uh, Manchester or back in NASA Ames, um, you know, we find the the right way and right to route to, to get there. It's um, not impossible. And uh, the chief scientist, um, you might know him, Dr. Maya Mayapen. He's also <laughs> from Tamil Nadu, so you know that's his uh, native place. Ma'am, uh, is it time? Yeah, <laughs> I'm about to start. Can project sorry. that? Oh, yeah. Yes.
मैम आई स्टार्ट द रिकॉर्डिंग फॉर द सेशन a very good afternoon to everybody here i'm here to welcome dr rakesh kumar who is currently working as research associate in national graphene institute ngi and the school of triple e university of manchester united kingdom uh, dr kumar has been a visiting research scholar to nasa ms research center california usa in 2013 to date and working on a collaborative research project on fabrication and testing of carbon nanofiber based biosensors for astronauts on board cardiac health monitoring dr rajesh kumar or rakesh kumar had been a president doctoral scholar at the university of manchester and completed a doctoral degree in engineering from the school of electrical and electronics engineering Un university of manchester dr kumar developed a unique suspended graphene based array chip for multiple sensing applications such as specific biosensor gas sensor pressure sensor and humidity sensors during his phd research work this work is waiting for its patent before joining uam dr kumar received mphil degree in micro and nanotechnology from the university of cambridge uk in 2009 10 and obtained a masters in electronics where he excelled as a gold medalist from the university of jammu and kashmir Jammu, uh, India, in 2002. Dr. Kumar has been working as faculty in Government Gandhi Memorial Science College Higher Education Department of Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir since 2005. We welcome you, sir, and I hand over the session to Dr. Rajesh uh, Rakesh Kumar. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you, Dr. Vidya, for the nice introduction. I really want to take um, you know opportunity to um, thank uh, my friend Shiva Kumar. and dr dhani bhai ji and his team um you know making this conference uh, during the pandemic when everyone is like so busy just saving their life and these people are connecting everyone ar around the world i was also amazed when uh, um yesterday in the inaugural session vice chancellor of the university was telling that the vit has been successful in conducting like 70 virtual conferences this is really amazing so yeah thank you very much again uh, for you know giving me an opportunity to come across the participants let me just share my slides so that i can go through my presentation um as i said like i'm going to speak on graphene based 2d material for electronics um sorry i think is this the give me a sec might be yeah it's okay so i mean the title is a little changed i would be talking on graphene based biosensors and uh, gas sensors But these vary of the fact that you know, um, though I'm working with a super flexible material that can uh, be a part of uh, your uh, wearable and flexible electronics, but I am working on a solid state electronics at the moment. But there is a lot of motivation for everyone, um, you know, to look into the possible uh, the research into um, you know using graphene for the, the flexible and wearable electronics. so during my slides i would be going through some of the aspects of like graphene graphene uh, extraction from a graphite or graphene synthesis routes then potential applications of graphene some of the products been produced by university of manchester and then my own research work um, using graphene as a gas sensor and biosensor in the end i would like to invite um, you know the participants especially those the students and researchers um, to look into the facilities we do have here in manchester um to you know conduct research and higher education in the field of graphene and other 2d materials so a bit of uh, um the institution and the place where i live and work um the city of manchester is first world modern industry city and university of manchester was uh, um a merger between a uh, umist university of manchester institute of science and technology and vectory university in 2004 but both these institutions were like you know early 7789th century so uh, that's why we say like university of manchester is around uh, half one and a half year uh, one and a half century year old um if we look into the the you know the campus of university it's spreaded over 2 to 3 kilometers within the um city center it's a beautiful uh, you know uh, one of the beautiful campus in uk um we just improve our world ranking from 29 to 27 27 
and in UK, University of Manchester is number five. At the moment, you know, the university has produced uh, around 25 Nobel laureates, and they are they were either working directly in the University of Manchester or they were alumni from the University of Manchester. So before going into uh, graphene and discussing it as a 2D material for you know different applications, I just want to make like a small introductory to uh, um, you know nanotechnology, nanomaterials, and their dimensionality. Um, you know we know that we can categorize all the nanomaterials in four categories, uh, saying three-dimensional, two-dimensional, one, and zero-dimensional. So the, this comes from the size size limitations as well as the charge confinement. A material with the three degree of freedom or a movement of the charge carries in all three directions would be a three-dimensional material like you know graphite or some other um, bulk materials. Graphene and something films that, that allows the charge movements only in two dimension, we call them like a two-dimensional material. And similarly, carbon nanotubes are one-dimensional and you know the quantum dots, they are zero-dimensional because the, the charge carriers are confined to their own space. They can only quantumly uh, channel through the the one quantum dot to the another dot or one quantum dot to a conducting channel. So here we introduce graphene. Um, if to understand graphene, we need to go back to graphite to see its uh, um, atomic structure. What we see that graphite is basically a purely um, made of purely carbon atoms, and these carbon atoms are connected um, in the form of layers um, to the neighboring carbon atoms through covalent bond. And these layers are stacked in a, in a specific fashion, one on the top of other. And when, you know, the, the simplest example of graphene you can find in a graphite picture, graphite pencil. So the pencil, when, when you write with the pencil, these layers slide one over the other, and that's why you see a, a mark. So in a, in a nutshell, what you, what you can expect that, you know, graphene, uh, which is the one layer of graphite whole structure, and that you can isolate these graphene films or graphene layers from, from uh, um, the graphite structure. So nobody knows that you know, the, the material that was used in early 16th or 17th century just to um, you know, mark sheep in the Europe would become a, a material for 21st century to change the, the face of the technology. So as I said, graphene is a single layer of carbon atoms connected to the neighboring atoms through covalent bond in a hexagonal um, crystal lattice. Um, this is what the unique property of uh, you know, graphene, um, because every single atom is a surface atom, and each carbon atom uh, you know, uh, have a four electrons, which they have like three electrons shared with the neighboring atom, the fourth one, which is called a pi electrons available. So that's why we have like, you know, the high electron density on a graphene film, because every atom su supplies one electron. So all the unique electronic properties are, are remarkable, or you say superlative properties comes from the unique structure of graphene. So um, if we again go back to uh, you know, the different types of nanomaterials, we can derive um, you know, all, the, all the materials from a single layer of graphene. If we can um, stack these graphene layers in a particular fashion, you can make a 3D um, stack of graphene with the, the tunable electronic and electrical or thermal properties. A graphene can be rolled into a, a nanotube, and at the same time, you know, you can pattern a, a bulky ball out of graphene sheet. So, um, with the, if you want to control the, the 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 different properties, the mechanical or electrical or chemical properties, graphene can be modified to make those. So. Um, I think everyone knows that graphene was isolated in 2004 um, here in the University of Manchester to a world-renowned physicist, Dr. Um, Kostya Novoslob and Professor um, Andre Geim. At that time, you know, they were um, busy in working isolating graphene from graphite and they got success in 2004. But graphene was not discovered in 2004. Graphene was existing even before two or three centuries early there was, there, there was no word for graphene, but it used to be like graphite, graphite oxide. So like early 19th century, um, you know, everyone knows about graphite and graphite oxide. Graphene word only came in 1986 when they, um, they find that, you know, the single layer of uh, graphite should be named as graphene and IUPAC uh, formalized that name in 1997. 
But after the 2004 experiment, which we call this a groundbreaking experiment of isolating graphene and then studying um, all the, the superlative properties like electrical, mechanical, thermal, um, and uh, you know other properties of graphene, there was a gold rush for graphene um, for different um, potential applications, both in electronics and as a material, material, um, material using its material properties. So um, because of these, um, you know, these, this pro pioneer work, both uh, uh, were given a Nobel Prize in physics in 2010. And we're still working on, um, you know, we are still finding that graphene has a, so much hidden potential, um, you know, in terms of like changing the electronics or the material properties. Um, I would like to, um, you know, introduce the part participants about the, the basic experiment done by um, the, the research group of Professor Andre Gaim and Kostya, which actually led to the uh, isolation of graphene uh, uh, from the graphite. And also in the end, uh, you know, they were, they were given a Nobel Prize for their work. So, if, you know, in the, in the beginning, uh, when there was like um, a, a common understanding about the, among the researchers that graphene cannot be a stable thermodynamically because it's a single, single atom thick and at room temperature, it might just uh, you know not be a stable. It may create a, it may go around like a, uh, it may shrink or it may get wrapped. But you know, with the experiment they did, uh, was the simplest experiment. So they started with the isolating graphene from graphite using a scotch tape. So you know, if you take a graphite piece of graphite and you take a scotch tape, and then you can just keep uh, pressing and peeling uh, it several times until and unless you uh, you start finding that you know you have um, these um, these layers separated on uh, on the, the on the scotch tape, and then finally you take uh, any substrate, uh, whether it's like an insulating substrate or silicon silicon oxide. Normally, you can transfer these uh, single layers of graphene onto that, and then you can further you know inspect it under the microscope or with other um, uh, other um, microscopy tools in order to um, you know, look into the single layer, double layer or multi-layer. And once you have a flake uh, of graphene on a silicon, silicon oxide surface, then you can actually you know, do a, you can make a device in order to um, extract all the electrical and magnetic uh, superconducting properties. For example, what you see in the picture A is a flake of graphene. It's a micron uh, size flake. And picture B is just an AFM image of the same flake, but the you can make devices. For example, uh, you know in figure E you would find an hall bar made on graphene uh, flake. The graphene was like you know um, uh, um, it was patterned uh, in order to make like a hall bar. So that was the first experiment the experiment device that the group from um, and Professor Andre and Professor Novoslov. Um, studied for um, you know, uh, ex extracting all the electronic properties of graphene. So, I mean, in 2004, when we could only do a graphene flake, but then over the time, you know, the graphene flake can be, um, you know, it, they need to be like a large scale fabrication of graphene in order to make electronic devices. But we do have like, you no know, a lot of um, routes or methods to um, synthesize, you know, graphene at, on a larger scale in order to make um, you know, um, very large scale device manufacturing. So just after this 2004 um, paper, there was like a um, you know, spark in the number of uh, publications in graphene and 2D materials. Uh, and also there was a linear uh, you know, change, the linear increase in um, the, um, the patent on graphene and graphene related work. And if you look in the world might, you know, we, uh, you know, India, China, America, UK, and Europe, they are the leader uh, in terms of publications and, you know, uh, work on graphene and graphene applications for technology. So I'll go through uh, some of the slides, um, you know, on graphene properties, because uh, that's very important to understand the material and then how we can make use of these, uh, these materials for different applications. So if you go back again, you know, back to the atomic structure of graphene, it's a hexagonal uh, lattice with the six carbon atoms connected through a, a sp2 hybridization, and the pi electrons is is a weak electron that can help in making a conduction. 
So if we look into the electronic structure, like the, the band structure, graphene does not have a band gap. That's why we do say like graphene is a semi-metal. It, it is not a semiconductor and it is not a, um, an insulator. It's a semiconductor that makes graphene uh, 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 not useful for electronic devices, but we can still tune the, this, this band gap in order to, you know, uh, in order to, to modify this band gap to make like electronic switcher, which I will show in, in the further slides. But this is very important and unique uh, um, structure, electronic structure of graphene that gives uh, us a lo large number of applications. So um, if we see that, you know, a single layer graphene do have uh, um, a very linear uh, dispersion of, uh, you know, in, um, energy at the Fermi level. But if you have a bilayer or trilayer, especially stag, then it's possible to create a band gap also. So um, the research is still going on how we can modify um, bilayer or trilayer in order to create a band gap. So there are different routes. Either you functionalize the graphene flakes or graphene uh, films to create a band gap, or you strain the, the graphene uh, film in order to create the band gap. But still, the research is going on to produce a large scale um, graphene and with the band gap so that we can use this uh, material for electronic, uh, especially for uh, switching applications. So if you look at uh, the properties of graphene, um, you know, graphene is one of the strongest material. The Young's modulus for graphene is around one terapascal with a 130 gigapascal tensile strength. That's why we say like graphene is 200 times stronger than steel. But please, we need to compare steel uh, atoms at us when they are in a single layer form. Uh, we cannot uh, compare steel in a bulk form with graphene. It's the thinnest material because uh, it's a thin single atom thick. And you know that the, the atom um, um, diameter is around 0.34 nanometer. Um, so this is the thinnest material. 97% uh, graphene is transparent. So it's very, very flexible also. It can be a good material for flexible and uh, transparent electronics. It's lightest and it's the strongest, but all at the same time, it has a high surface to volume ratio because every single atom is basically a surface atom. There's no bulk material. And because of all these properties, graphene is a superlative uh, in terms of electrical conductivity. You know, you, you get a, a mobility of charge carriers around 200,000, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, compared to the, any other materials. So graphene is called ambipolar because as we said that, you know, there's, a, there's no band gap and you can transfer the charge current from electron to hole while mod modifying graphene with a gate voltage. So um, I'll uh, like to go through some of the graphene synthesis and transfer method. Um, you know, like we cannot make uh, a large scale devices from uh, a flake. And for flake, you can only just take like a micron size flake from graphite. But in order to make large, large scale device fabrication, you really need a uh, graphene on a large area. Uh, but there are different methods, you know, to uh, synthesize graphene. Either it's a um, top-down process or a bottom-up. In the top-down, you start with the graphite, and then you apply either liquid phase exfoliation or ox oxidation exfoliation method by which you break down graphite into individual graphene sheet. You may end up individual graphene sheet by liquid phase exfoliation, or you may end up, um, you know, uh, graphene oxides with the graphene oxide is a form of graphene with oxygen functionality around. So you need to reduce these oxygen graphene oxide in order to make um, reduce, you know, like a pristine graphene, which we call reduced graphene. There's another way for large scale fabrication, which is like bottom up approach. This is called chemical vapor deposition where you can uh, deposit, uh, you know, graphene on a metal surface uh, or uh, on a silicon carbide um, substrate. So for the liquid phase, we generally use these instruments uh, in order to break down graph graphite into graphene sheets. Um, we may have like two methods that we I was telling about liquid phase and um, you know the oxidation process. By liquid phase, you sonicate this at a high um, sonication energy and try to isolate um, you know these sleet sheets from the graphite with the, some um, solvents. Even water can be used, but um, for uh, uh, surfactant-based uh, liquid phase oxidation, you use uh, some kind of surfac surfactants and intercorrectors because these uh, 
these surfactants actually interclade between the layers and then separate out um, during the sonication process. The other method which we were talking about the CVD based graphene. So CVD based graphene, you know, by which you can actually make a large scale graphene on a, on a metal surface. And generally they use nickel uh, or copper as a substrate for growing uh, multi-layer graphene or a single layer graphene. So mostly like nickel is nickel substrate is used for multi-layer graphene because the carbon atoms are soluble in nickel and they start nucleating un, in, within the nickel uh, you know, substrate within the metal. On the other hand, for uh, if you want to grow graphene on a copper, so the copper, um, the atoms, the carbon atoms in copper are insoluble, so it nucleates on top of the on top of the copper. But you can still make a two layers or three layers on um, on uh, you know copper substrate. So I mean, there are so many applications. This is not my area of research. I'm not synthesizing graphene, but someone can go into the literature. Uh, you are not just making one layer or two layers are multi layers, but you can also make the graphene with the um, twisted layers. So there's a huge research going on uh, twisted layer graphene because there are some other properties that are coming in a twisted layer uh, graphene. Um, the other method where we can generate a large scale, uh, you know, large scale uh, CVD graphene, it's called like batch to batch or roll to roll CVD technology. Um, again, I would say like, you know, these, uh, these technologies are in their early stage uh, in terms of quality and in terms of, um, you know, quality control and in terms of like properties, uh, we're still working on it in order to get a high quality graphene for electronic devices. So there's a roll to roll method. They still use the same um, technology of, you know, heating the, um, the, the materials, the, the copper, wire, uh, copper film um, in a CVD furnace and then breaking the, the source of carbon from acetylene or meth methane in order to nucleate on uh, copper film. So if we compare uh, you know, the quality of graphene with the synthesis method, we find that the high quality we get you know, with the, uh, again, uh, you know, with the, um, either with the expo ex exfoliation, mechanical exfoliation or molecular assembly, but they are expensive. On the other hand, for large scale, uh, fabrication or synthesis of graphene, the CVD is the method where we are, um, we can have a large scale fabrication. But the problem with that is that, you know, we still uh, have a very less control on the quality of the um, CVD graphene for electronics methods. So once the graphene is uh, synthesized, they, they, the way the graphene is, you know, used for applications, especially for electronic devices, we need to transfer it onto a onto the solid sub substrate or and even like on a flexible substrate because it's, it's it, you know it's synthesized on a metal substrate you really need to transfer um, in order to make devices so the common method that they use is called graphene transfer method you need to protect the graphene with some polymer and then etch away the, the metal film underneath through a wet etching and then it's transferred onto uh, the target substrate so there are uh, there are so many challenges even during the transfer because most of the, the transfers are wet transfers and during the transfer you trap a lot number of impurities and even water molecules that affects the properties of graphene when it's on a, on a substrate because the interaction between the substrate and graphene film it's a just single layer with high electrons so any charge impurities will affect its electrical and chemical properties. So we're still working on, uh, you know, how to improve uh, um, the graphene transfer method. There are uh, dry transfer methods, but they, that's still, um, you know, challengeable how to do a, like a, a large scale uh, dry transfer, like six inch or eight inch wafer. So this is what you see, you know, this is like an optical image of graphene on a silicon oxide surface. And uh, what you see is, you know, one, on the picture on the left is just like a, monochrome um, and the one on the right side is a color image and uh, um, you can see those patches and impurities stored under the um, you know graphene film and uh, there's another method of graphene transfer is called um, you know roll to roll transfer the way the roll to roll synthesis uh, there's another way of like roll to roll transfer and this is very special uh, you know and useful for um, transferring graphene on uh, on flexible electrodes for variable and flexible electronics or sensor fabrication methods. 
So um, how do we identify once the graphene is on a solid surface or maybe it's on a flexible surface? There are different tools uh, to identify single layer, bilayer, or multi-layer graphene on a substrate. Um, we use the SCM, TEM, Raman spectroscopy, and even like a X-rays uh, and uh, microscope uh, uh, X-ray tools in order to identify single, double, and multi-layers. What you see, like in the picture on the left uh, bottom, is a single layer graphene on a silicon silicon oxide surface, and uh, the middle picture uh, in the bottom row, you see um, a TEM image, and you can easily see these carbon atoms, uh, you know, honeycomb shape carbon atoms connected um, along the, the sheet. Uh, a bilayer picture would be different than um, a single layer. You can see an, an impression of um, hexagonally connected carbon film. And if we go to a you know single atom uh, film, you can zoom in. You can see these bright spots. These bright spots are the atoms and the electron clouds. And the distance between each atom cloud is around 0.14 nanometer, which is a bond length. So these are the highly sophisticated tool in order to identify graphene on uh, uh, solid surfaces. But we can easily uh, identify graphene under a, a high resolution microscope if graphene is transmitted, transferred on a silicon oxide with a specific uh, thickness. So mostly if the thickness of the silicon oxide is like 280 to 300 nanometer, then you, from the contrast of graphene and silicon oxide, you can identify even a single layer and a bilayer or multi-layer graphene. So these are the tool that we use, but the most powerful tool in order to identify single layer or you know, multi-layer graphene is a, is a Raman spectroscopy. So with the Raman, Raman spectroscopy, you get a signature peaks. And from these signature peaks, like you know, D band, G band and 2G band, from these peaks, you can easily identify you know, whether the, your graphene is a high quality and it's a single layer and whether it's a doped or it's not doped or it's a, it's a pristine graphene. So these are the tools, as I mentioned, that you know the, the Raman spectroscopy can quickly and uh, non-invasively uh, provide you information about the quality of graphene and the number of layers of graphene. So same say that you know graphene was not the only material, 2D material after um, you know the break, groundbreaking experiment. There was like so many materials that uh, has the same dimensionality. And they've been studied, especially you know when graphene does not have a band gap, um, but many other materials um, uh, in order to you know create a band gap, they've been studied uh, that we can still use this two dimensionality feature, and at the same time, if we can have like um, uh, you know a band gap to make these devices, these materials for device manufacturing. So I'd like to get take you through a small video uh, about the Manchester. Uh, you know, uh, uh, upcoming Graphene City. I hope it's a two second, two minute uh, um, video. You would like, uh, you know, the way the, the Graphene uh, is being taken in the city of Manchester and in the, in the University of Manchester. Please watch this. Manchester, the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, home to the father of atomic theory, John Dalton, and the father of modern computing, Alan Turing. From Karl Marx to the contraceptive pill, from the co-op movement to the first hard drive, this city has been a constant source of new ideas. Now, oh, Manchester is the center of a new revolution, and it's called graphene. And it was isolated here in the physics department at the University of Manchester. It's so extraordinary that in 2010, the scientists who made it were awarded the Nobel Prize for physics. These geniuses did what no one had done before and isolated graphene, creating the first ever man-made material in two dimensions. Graphene has almost limitless potential. It's so light and so thin, but it's strong and it's dynamic. The visions, the predictions of sci-fi writers and tech gurus are finally within our grasp. It is a carbon sheet, one atom thick, but 200 times stronger than steel. It's the lightest, most conductive man-made material on Earth. It can be used for DNA sequencing at a nanoscopic level. It can be programmed to attach itself to specific cells like cancer cells, which will revolutionize medicine. It's almost completely impermeable. It could be fundamental to the storage and transport of fuels 
of the future. It stretches, twists, rolls to create bendable devices, not just touch screens, but flexible, transparent components. Graphing devices will be able to carry electricity more efficiently. It could bring us the revolutionary possibility of electric plants. In a few years, we could all be wearing graphene-laced smart clothing. We could be writing, painting, electrically conductive reactive inks. The list is endless. And it is all because of graphene. And it was discovered here at the University of Manchester Lab in a city that has always encouraged new ideas. The material of the future in a revolutionary setting. Wow. See, for this city, it's not so much a question of where do we start. It's more about... Where do we go next? All right, okay. <clears throat> I hope you like this, um, this um, video because I always show this video in order to encourage the, um, the upcoming researchers and students who are looking for a new area of research and higher education. So let's go through a some of the graphene applications and the product that we have been, uh, you know, uh, we saw this, um, these products are like from the University of Manchester. So, I mean, before that, what we see like application and in integration, um, you know, if we see a roadmap for graphene, graphene based um, technologies, come upcoming technologies, we are here when we are using graphene only for sensors, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and optoelectronic devices, because as I mentioned that we, the graphene does not have a, um, you know, band gap. So, at the moment, most of the applications are uh, either sensor technologies, uh, whether it's a flexible or solid state based sensors, or we are mixing graphene with the, um, polymers in order to make a composite with, um, you know, modified mechanical and thermal and electrical properties. But over the time, you know, by the, by the 2028 or 2030, you would say, see that, you know, graphene will be covering almost all the um, you know, device areas, whether it's um, transistors or implantable device in order to sense uh, some of the medical applications, or medical signals. So um, if we look into the map for graphene applications, we would see like, you know, it's almost covering all major areas, whether it's a flexible electronics, the, the, the sensors for medical applications, some of these, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the use of application in industries and supports um, or energy generation, um, you know, even the, some of the, get, the, the, the devices for environmental monitoring uh, and uh, wearable electronics. Uh, so as uh, meaning to say that, you know, graphene could be an, a, a vital element or material uh, covering all these types of applications. These are the products that's been uh, produced here in the uh, University of Manchester. I mean, there are so many, I've just brought the one which are, uh, you know, the highlighted, um, uh, uh, these are the highlights uh, from University of Manchester, for example, you know, these graphene sieves that turns the seawater into drinkable water and McLaren uh, watch where the graphene was mixed with the polymer in order to make it a low uh, weight and, you know, effective watches. Similarly, graphene is being used um, in Innova 8 shoes, uh, especially in the soles in, in order to make these shoes like with the, the yield strength gone 50% more and they have a better grip on a wet wet gra ground graphene has been used in uh, electrical bulbs so not as a filament but as the conducting elements there are applications there are a research group of Chin, professor chinzia she's uh, busy in making printable electronics so they, she's expert in uh, you know graphene ink to make the printable electronics and also some uh, applications of graphene in automobiles in order to make the parts uh, of these and recently, the University of Manchester, you might see a, um, a recent paper in, um, you know, nano letters about using graphene for um, infrared text, text, textiles. So, um, you know, the, the graphene is being used as an eye infrared, infrared um, camouflage where you can electrically tune the emissivity of infrared uh, signal from the body that can be used for um, defense applications. And besides that, you know, there are uh, meta devices or, you know, flexible radar absorbing um, applications because these are not the work that I'm involved, but one can easily look into the applications of graphene, um, you know, for all flexible electronics. 
also, you know, graphene is being used. Um, we do have a, a recent collaboration with Highways of England and the University of Manchester to use graphene in uh, future roads. Um, out of the sky, I would say that future roads can, can be like a conductive. Um, you know, some of these applications can be to automatically control the traffic or uh, informing the, the weather reports or things, you know, the road conditions. But these are the things that would come up. And the, the idea is just being started up generating. Graphene is also being used in, you know, concrete in order to enhance their yield strength as well as because it's a water resistance. So it can protect the uh, steel used in, the, in, in the concrete or in, you know, um, uh, in the buildings. Um, now I would like to take you to my, um, you know, the company that we just, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, we just uh, established in 2019, Riptron. Uh, it's a spin-out company from University of Manchester that is, um, that is like, you know, de developing suspended graphene-based gas sensors for air, real-time air quality monitoring. So I think I would have uh, um, another video on it um, to share with here. So let's go through another video. Hello, I am Dr. Max Pizzerato from the School of Electrical and Electronic Engineering here at the University of Manchester. Our group has developed a novel gas sensor for volatile organic compound detection. This technology utilizes suspended graphene membranes to provide real-time ultra-sensitive VOC detection. The sensor requires low voltages to operate as real-time response, high sensitivity, and a large terrestrial range of detection, all within a miniaturized 5 mm square chip. VOCs are emitted from solids or liquids with high vapor pressure, often originating from combustion and often toxic, so on-site real-time monitoring is vital. Currently, photoionizing detectors are used for VOC monitoring. PID devices are expensive, bulky, and lack specificity unless coupled with special filters. Our technology utilizes suspended graphene membrane to provide real-time ultra-sensitive VOC detection. The use of low-resistant graphene means that the resultant device is low power, small and functional on chip. This graphene membrane can be functionalized on the top surface allowing for specificity and high sensitivity. CMOS compatibility means production of the device can be scaled up on the semiconductor fabrication line. This technology would compete with PIDs on acquisition time, sensitivity and specificity, but would be considerably cheaper and small enough to be integrated in a mobile phone. This technology has the following key benefits a larger theoretical range of detection than PID sensors. It is a very small device and functional on chip. Production is CMOS compatible. Only a low voltage power supply is required. It has immediate response and high sensitivity. This novel gas sensor has applications in many markets, like monitoring of emissions during production and processing of hydrocarbons, detection of VOCs during fuel filling detection of VOCs during manufacturing processes, such as painting or coating, environmental monitoring of air pollution and air quality, and construction of personal sensor badges. We are currently working on appropriate graphing functionalization to extend the detection capabilities to lung cancer biomarkers and breath analysis. We are currently looking to collaborate with companies interested in the production and exploitation of gas sensors to assist us with getting this novel sensor to market. Please contact us using the link at the end of this video if you feel that this technology could be of benefit to your company. All right, so, you know, at Riptron, we are developing suspended graphene-based gas sensors and um, not just the gas sensors, if you can functionalize these, the suspended structure of graphene, it can be a selective uh, biomarker detection is possible uh, in, uh, um, you know, uh, in medical field. But at the moment, we are only focusing on, um, you know, selective gas sensors while functionalizing or you say like modifying the, the graphene in, in our devices. And the use of like why we need um, to look for these, you know, real time air quality monitoring because we understand that you know 90% of the planet is now polluting you know is breathing polluted air 
um, and this has been causing millions of deaths worldwide. And the situation in India and in China is worse than um, any other any other you know country in the world in terms of like the number of deaths per year. So um, you know, just not the implications, uh, health implications, but also the world economies are affected by it. Like you know, US is, is losing two hundred billion dollar every year in terms of like work loss and hospital and welfare costs. And I think I can skip this. This is just like in a case study done in city of Manchester. Um, there are some solutions to uh, monitor real time air quality, you know, in the vicinity, uh, but these solutions are very expensive at the moment and they are bulky. You cannot have like them as like a personal sensor or variable sensors. So we really need like an, a, a disruptive solution that can provide you and information hourly basis. And also, you know, you, you can say that this is your personal sensor or you can wear it. If you look into the, the, the global gas sensing market, um, you know, it's in a billion dollars can be um, forecasted into an individual sensor or sensor systems. So both the, you know, the, the growth rate is around eight and more than 8% covering all the applications, major applications. There are some specific gases that, you know, the, 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 these gases of interest um, for both indoor health and outdoor health are even in the, the livestock. And additional market is there for gas sensors in ma medical diagnostics and process control equipments. So Riptron is working on um, you know, a suspended structure here. I'm just going to introduce the technology. So what you see basically a device uh, uh, you know, it, it can be any substrate, whether a flexible substrate or uh, a solid state substrate. So graphene is suspended over a, over a, a cavity or a, you say like a, um, a trench and you, you know, it's, it's capped by uh, some metal contacts and it's a resistive device at the moment. Uh, if we don't functionalize the graphene with the specific probes, then graphene is sensitive to everything. It can detect any different, uh, you know, gas molecules interacting with the graphene and changing its electrical property. But the idea is to functionalize this graphene with the specific receptors or specific you know, uh, material in order to make is gas selective sensors where we have a specific market. So this is our um, you know, device layout. It's already on a wafer scale. And uh, um, you know, we, at the moment we did it on a 10 millimeter square, but it can easily be um, extended to a wafer scale production. The solution is uh, smaller at the moment. If the device is only three millimeters square, but we are thinking now like to fabricate on a one millimeter square so that we can easily integrate it into a, a dongle or a, like a mobile attachment or making them as like a personal, um, you know, air quality monitoring. So it can be easily connected over the Wi-Fi network and then the data can be assessed through a mobile app, which has not been seen, um, you know, in, uh, but with the existing technologies. Um, it's a selective uh, sensor because the graphene uh, is modified with specific material. And uh, since the technology is a platform technology, you can modify graphene with any different material to make it uh, very gas specific. So that is an advantage over the existing um, selective gas sensor technologies. And since the sensor can be easily recovered with the UV irradiation, so that is another advantage of um, suspended graphene Based gas sensor. So when we compare it with the existing technologies like metal oxide based semiconductor or electrochemical cluster based um, sensors or even like infrared based sensors, we do have like few advantages. But you know, um, yes, this is a comparative technology. But if we look into the power consumption of an electro uh, on metal oxide semiconductor, we really need a high power in order to generate the required temperature for operation. Wherever, um, whereas the, the Riptron based, uh, you know, the suspended graphene based uh, sensors just work on a room temperature. It does not need a, a high, high temperature to detect the, the gas molecules. It's a selective sensor. You can um, modify the graphene surface with any material and, uh, um, you know, you can make it functional to only spe specific gases. At the moment, we are working one indoor uh, air pollutant detection of formaldehyde and one outdoor which, which is NOx. So we are actually moving towards a, a prototype display very soon, and then uh, we can move to uh, other gases also. So there are advantages in terms of like dimensionality, price of the chip, and uh, you know it's a suitably with for multiple gases, and also easily recovery um, of the gas. So 
um, we are at a different um, you know prototype level especially for um, so what I, I want to say here like you know we have been testing these uh, sensors non-specific sensors for all the types of um, you know the common pollutants whether it's ammonia nitro oxide common carbon monoxide or toluene but uh, um, as I said we need to make it a gas selective and uh, we recently validated our results for formaldehyde so you know we can easily functionalize the the surface with the specific material to make this gas sensor uh, you know selective to the formaldehyde what do you see on on the, the plots uh, um, you know on the right um, the plot a is for uh, um, you know with the varying concentration of formaldehyde uh, the signal um, from the sensor uh, changes quickly and you know it responds quickly to the change in concentration um, the b is a, is a, is a is a graph for a graphene uh, not suspended but it's a supported on a, a surface so as i mentioned there you know graphene is a single atom thick as soon as it you lay down it on a surface the surface based in you know uh, imperfections start you know diluting the pristine properties of graphene but when you know it's a surface free graphene you maintain all the the pristine properties of graphene um, in a suspended graphene structures so uh, picture c and d is just showing how fast you can recover a suspended graphene you know a sensor than a supported graphene which you know does not show any recovery rather it damaged the graphene when it was uh, irradiated with the uv light so this has a specific application in real time air quality monitoring where you need to monitor the the concentration level the real you know the real concentration level and if it goes up sensor should show higher concentration signal and if it goes down you should see that you know the sensor is recovering automatically and we have validated our results against methanol toluene and also um, acetone uh, once it's coated with the specific material it does not show any selectivity um, uh, sensitivity towards uh, non selective gases so that proves its specificity. Uh, besides the gas sensing, <clears throat> I was also working on a pressure sensor, graphene-based pressure sensor, because pressure sensors uh, sensitivity is uh, determined from the thickness of the membranes. And I don't think that you know anything can be thinner than a single atom thick graphene. So we studied the, the you know the the, the graphene-based suspended graphene-based pressure sensor, and what we found that you know they are best um, you know um, pressure sensors, especially when your pressure is very, very low. And this has a specific application in medical uh, field where you need to um, you know, um, detect low pressures, uh, whether it's body pressures or some other applications. Um, we also studied our sensors in order to um, detect uh, some biomarkers. I think uh, um, here what we are showing is a dopamine. And I also did a GABA as a neurotransmitter detection using graphene so we need to functionalize graphene in order to detect specifically the concentration of GABA and um, neurotransmit like these uh, these um, the dopamine because these dopamines and GABA they they generate uh, tiny signals when they are excited by either by uh, UV radiation or specific light or by drugs so we are still working on it and the data is still under uh, you know um, analysis so we did these experiment while taking a drosophila brain, sorry, drosophila whole cell, and also the brain slice of mice. As I said, like, you know, we are looking to make a flexible, implantable, um, you know, uh, graphene-based uh, sensors that can be implanted into the brain in order to read the, the brain signal. And recently, we now start moving uh, towards the current situation. Everyone is, like, interested to find um, and a replacement of P RT PCR um, type of test, which takes like three hour to four hour testing time. And of course it takes like eight days in order to get the report, but the test itself is like a three hours. But with the graphene, uh, graphene based, electronic based detection, one can uh, get like the results within 10 minutes, whether you have a coronavirus uh, uh, in your blood sample or not. I mean, this is not uh, the work done by us. This is just an example recently published in ACS Nano that you know the, fun the graphene can be functionalized with the specific SARS-CoV-2 spike antibody which can detect the coronavirus uh, in a blood sample. So 
I mean to say like we we just propose um, we just propose to use our sensors for the detection of coronavirus or similar viruses um, you know in future uh, using the the existing technology on functionalizing graphene and uh, making a biomarker detection. So um, I think uh, uh, this is what all, all when I was like talking about the technology and whether Riptron is doing and what uh, um, you know. University of Manchester is doing in terms of like 2D graphene and 2D other 2D materials. Uh, I like to take uh, these, uh, you know, the students uh, about the funding opportunities and <clears throat> the facilities in University of Manchester if they are looking to work on, uh, um, you know, graphene and 2D materials. So graphene hosts uh, two world-class institutions, National Graphene Institute with the um, state-of-the-art facilities for research within a, like one building, you have a, a three-story, 1,500 square meter uh, clean room, you know, with this class 100, and you got every facility within the same building if you, you know, planning to work. So you are most welcome to interact with me or any, any person, uh, you know, in, 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 in different departments um, to figure out like if there are existing, um, you know, existing uh, funding available or there are some types of entering. So just not like, uh, um, you know, technology development, you know, University of Manchester is also helping if you have an idea that have a, that can be a commercial um, entity. So uh, in order to connect the, the you know, the, the business world with the, the academic, uh, University of Manchester has a specialized institutions like Graphene Engineering and Innovation Center. Um, the people over there help to connect the academics to the, um, the outside world and you know to showcase their technology and find out the investor that can help them to bring their technology into the market. We recently has this Henry Royce Institute um, just before, uh, I think it was announced just before um, the pandemic, but as soon as they, they you know, are going back to the lab starts, I think we will start working uh, and using the, the research facilities uh, in this institution also. So, <clears throat> In terms of like number of PhD students uh, and the research grants available in Manchester, we do have a sizable number of PhD student enrollment every year. And there are so many different routes to get funding. There are routes either directly from the University of Manchester or from the principal investigator, or you can find some international scholarships to come and you know either work as a PhD student or a postdoctoral um, researcher. Here I like to um, you know, acknowledge my team. Dr. Max Migliato is a team leader and Professor Young and Professor Mrs. are the leading scientists and academician in uh, solid state electronics and uh, graphene based technology. Um, then there's uh, um, you know, um, other uh, senior lecturers and PhD and postdoc students in my group. And here at uh, NASA Ames, Dr. Maya Mayapen, you would be surprised he's from Tamil Nadu. So um, he is one, he is the, the chief scientist and he is the leader of the Center for Nanotechnology and Bio, like Nanotechnology at Ames. Um, there's a group of uh, um, other scientists and research, researchers. Um, so if anyone is interested, um, you know, you can directly contact to Dr. Maya Pampan. He's a very nice guy uh, in order to find out the solution for you to work in collaboration uh, or visiting scientists as I was there as a visiting scientist. So um, yeah, this is what uh, all I have. I hope I haven't taken more than uh, the time was allotted to me. I will be very happy if you want to have like some questions um, related to uh, graphene, graphene applications, and uh, even like the work I did in NASA Ames about carbon nanotube based biosensors. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um... You have walked us through the graphene synthesis methods. That was uh, very interesting. And uh, the recent uh, advancement in the GFED for uh, uh, COVID-19 diagnosis, that was also, you know, mind-storming. So uh, we thank you so much for introducing our students to all, uh, for all the opportunities that are available with uh, the University of Manchester and for all the research funding uh, opportunities that are present around. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Vidya. Yes, sir. Um, sir, uh, can we have uh, the next speaker on board? Okay.
any questions? Questions? To look offline or? So can we make it offline? Yeah, it's okay. I have one yeah. uh, question to Dr. Rakesh. Uh, have you worked anything on the breath analysis by using this? Well, uh, that's what our future work will be because, um, you know, we are functionalizing this graphene in order to detect acetone from the breath. Um, I still need to find out the exact material that can selectively, okay. you know, and, you know, analyze, you know, it's selectively detect acetone or methanol because, you know, anything that sits on graphene, uh, it gets, um, it gets sense, right? So we need to identify, um, you know, the, the materials um, okay. that can selectively detect, um, you know, specific biomarkers in breath. Okay, we are interested. I think we can discuss offline. Okay, because uh, we are working on metal oxide for this purpose. We can sure. think about. Uh, uh, we will discuss about it. And Thank another you. question is that uh, what about this uh, humidity uh, effect on this? So I tell you, um, I think I I just uh, I'm, because I cannot bring all the slides. You know, when we tested uh, the functional. No, no, I just asked graphene. Yeah. Yeah. When we did the okay. functionalized graphene does not, uh, uh, it's very less sensitive to, uh, you know, water molecules because the, when it's functionalized, the graphene is okay. covered with the, you know, the functioning material. But if it is like, you know, a non-functionalized graphene is very sensitive to, um, to water molecules. And especially, you know, we have these suspended structures. So what happens like, you know, when the water goes on and if it starts building up, the graphene membrane starts straining. So when they start straining, then it may not be even like a, a polar effect of molecules, you know, giving a parallel resistance, but because of the straining, the resistance of the graphene start changing. This we see only in, um, in the case of non-functionalized graphene, but in a functionalized graphene, you, you also get a yield strength, you know, like a, a little strength to these suspended structures. So the effect of water molecules at a weight was less as compared to a non-specific, like unfunctionalized graphene. So, we can uh, we can just suppress the effect of uh, um, you know humidity on on suspended structures. Okay, I think we'll discuss offline. I think we are interested, and we can discuss in there. Uh, sure. Because yes. uh, Vidya is uh, waiting for to bring the another speaker. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh. Thank you very much, Vidya. Thank you, sir. Uh, can I now have Dr. Baskar Duran on board? Yes, ma'am. Doctor Pascal is online. Yeah. yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Hi. A very warm welcome to the conference. Oh, thank you. Thanks for that. And thanks for the organizing committee who invited us uh, in to give some presentation and uh, to share our previous research. I'm now uh, here to welcome Dr. Baskar Dudem. He's a research fellow at the Advanced Technology Institute, ATI, University of Surrey, UK. He received the Master's of Technology degree from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, India. He received the PhD degree from Institute for Wearable Convergence Electronics, IWCE, Kyunghee University, Korea, specializing in tribo piezoelectric nanogenerators for wearable electronics. He also worked at Kale University, India, as a teaching faculty and IWCE as a postdoctoral fellow. His current research interest is focused on wearable and flexible piezo triboelectric nanogenerators for energy harvesting and motion sensor applications, photovoltaic and hybrid energy cells. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thanks for the brief introduction about me. <clears throat> Yeah, I would like to share my screen. So are you able to share? Yes. Yeah. Are you able to see my screen? Is that visible, Dr. Vidya? Uh, not it, not it, sir.
Are you facing any difficulty, sir? Yes. Please. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, sir, you have a share screen option at the bottom row. Yes, row. yes, sir. I, I saw it and uh, okay. You have the permissions for sharing it. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, now I think you yeah, are able yeah, to see. Yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. It's okay for yes, multi, uh, it's visible for all the multiple users or only yes, one? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah for multiple will, viewers it is uh, visible. So you can just okay. go to the full screen mode. Yeah, sure. Thanks for that. Yeah, it's fine, sir. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, sir. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, thanks for uh, the conference uh, committee members uh, who given me the opportunity to present my work. Here, I would like to present some of my research work uh, in which we have uh, used to harvest the biomechanical energies. <clears throat> what we have did is um, uh, we have developed a robust and a flexible tribal electric nanometers. Usually, these biomechanical energies are uh, not attended by the most of the peoples. This can generate by using uh, the daily human activities like walking, running, and uh, jumping, or touching some objects or driving the car. Uh, so we have uh, used these energies uh, to convert into the mechanical uh, to convert into the electricity. Uh, so <clears throat> before going to uh, the discussion about the work, here is the contents. We have we have developed tribal nanometers. How it is important and how it is going to work. Uh, would like to introduce uh, in the introduction part. And there are several approaches have been followed to increase the performance of tribal nanometers previously and uh, how they have followed. And uh, compared to those techniques, what we have uh, followed differently and how it is going to be efficient. Uh, we have used the different types of materials like textiles and the patterned polymers, as well as the biodegradable or bio waste materials uh, to develop a tribal nanometers. And finally, these tribal nanometers have been used to harvest these biomechanical energies uh, to convert these biomechanical energies into electricity and uh, supply those uh, electricity into uh, for the for electronic displays or artificial intelligent systems. <clears throat> Basically, nowadays uh, we are using so many artificial inter intelligent systems. So, based on that, we need the much power to supply those AI systems. Uh, so, uh, to supply those AI systems, we uh, need the more power and we have to harvest the more energy. Uh, usually, what we are using uh, to power these systems is until now we are using the conventional energy sources. Uh, so, these conventional energy sources is going to produce the pollution, environmental pollutions, and so it can uh, not be used uh, for the longer time. Moreover, it, they are going to be reduced, be using a lot. Uh, so, researchers have been focused on the renewable energy resources, uh, which can which cannot be everlasting, uh, like uh, solar, geothermal, ocean wave, wind, and mechanical energies. So, out of these several uh, energies or renewable energy sources, we have focused on mechanical energy sources, which are abundant, abundantly available, and it can be available in our daily life. <clears throat> so, uh, in order to uh, harvest those uh, energies. Uh, usually, uh, there are several energies like uh, solar energy, geothermal, ocean, and wind, as I have mentioned previously. So, uh, mechanical energy is one of the energy which can be easily available from our daily human activities or uh, by using the machinery movements, uh, like uh, by cycling it or by rotation of the cycle wheel, can be generated. And this energy, as I have mentioned, it's not attended fully and it is not harvested previously a lot. So use, uh, focusing on this energy, we can harvest uh, those energy can be easily supply uh, the portable electronic devices or AI systems could be work. <laughs> so uh, how to convert this mechanical energy, energy into electricity? There are several phenomena used by uh, the researchers previously, like is electric uh, effects, or tribal electric uh, effect and the ferroelectric pyroelectric effects. However, compared to all these uh, uh, nanometers, tribal electric effect, tribal electric nanometers have gained much focus. Like it's uh, getting uh, more focus or it's getting more advantageous features. For example, <clears throat> sorry. For example, uh, we can generate this. In a, we can develop these materials using 
uh, the very uh, uh, freely available materials like bio uh, bio materials as well as the polymers which materials can be easily degraded into environments uh, for for example if we develop any piezoelectric or pyroelectric materials mostly oxide materials or uh, some chemically rich materials which cannot be easily degraded into environments but whereas using uh, the tablet nanometers most of the materials can be easily degraded and eco friendly moreover developing this uh, nanometers can be very uh, easy and cost effective too uh, so <clears throat> it can how it could work the tablet and how it could work as we know uh, from our childhood we know about the conduction and induction of uh, electricity generation like when the charged materials Uh, come into contact uh, with other material in direct contact or in indirect contact we can generate that uh, electricity so based on this phenomena triboelectric nanometer can be work it can be work based on two fundamental principles like contact ele- electrification another is the electrostatic induction what is contact ele- electrification is when we are bringing the both the materials come into contact with each other can generate uh, the charges on top of the other material and um, giving uh, generating on this material is gives the loss of electrons or loss of charges it gives the holes like uh, an electric charges is going to be generate on top of this materials and these charges is going to be supply uh, some electricity or give the electricity to the external circuits <clears throat> so uh, we uh, everybody we in our childhood we have performed some experiments like uh, rubbing our pen or rubbing uh, Uh, something uh, with our hair and bringing it near to our hair or again or near to the cat and near to the papers and all it's uh, based mainly based on the tribal creation and those papers is going to attract towards uh, the pencil uh, at the same time during the winter if we touch any object metallic object it gives some spark like uh, electricity in our body it's only is because of uh, contact electrification or the tribal uh, electrification using this fundamental or the basic principle we are going to generate uh, the electricity uh, using the tribal electric nanometers <clears throat> so uh, tribal electric nanometers is uh, have several advantages as i have mentioned as compared to uh, the other nanometers it have several advantages like it is simple to develop and cost effective fabrication techniques and as well as gives a high output power the most of the materials in used in tribal nanometers are eco friendly and it gives the stable performance even though if it is damages when we uh, throw it it's going to be degraded very easily and we can very easily develop the new one uh, so actually uh, nanometers tribal nanometers are developed in 2012 or proposed in 2012 by the zedel wangs group and from the 2012 to 2013 they have dramatically improved improved the output power like it uh, attain up to 313 watt per meter square it is very high it could be uh, very easily uh, <clears throat> supply to uh, the ai systems like uh, mobiles and uh, displays and watches and all uh, so based on uh, as we have discussed when we are bringing both the materials uh, coming together it gives the tribal electric charge density and based on uh, the tendency to to give the electrons or the gain the electrons these tribal electric materials have divided into two parts one is positive and another is negative for example one material is going to contact with other this is positively rich which can give uh, the electrons very easily and means it can have an ability to lose the electrons very easily and other material have the ability to gain the electrons very easily it's called which the material can lose the electrons it's called a positive tribal electric material and the other material which easily grab or gain the electrons is uh, characterized as the negatively tribal electric materials uh, so when we are uh, here is the simple structure of tribal electric nanometers we are going to take one is the negative material another is the positive material they are separated with certain distance like uh, some small distance it is going to be in the micro range so when the positive material is coming to contact with the negative material it generates the charges or uh, it gives the electrons to the negative it's that is called negative materials and the red is going to be the uh, positive material and it is giving the negative charges to other material it's going to be lose those electrons is remains as in holes it's called the charges of positive uh, uh, positive charges 
So uh, here, when they are contact, it uh, gives some electrons to negative material and other remain on top of the positive material. It gives an electrostatic, it uh, reaches an electrostatic equilibrium. Then there is no flow is going to absorb, flow of charges is going to absorb across the external circuit uh, through the electric connections. At the same time, when we, uh, we are separating these materials, when it comes together and when we are separating these materials, then uh, the electrostatic equilibrium is going to disturb and the charge flow is going to occur from one electrode to other electrode. Uh, so at that case, this charge flow can be gathered and it can be further supplied to the electronic systems like uh, displays or the watches. Uh, so further, when we are separating it into the maximum distance where it can reach the electrostatic equilibrium there, there is no flow is going to be absorbed. Flow of charges is going to absorb. At the same time, again, when we are bringing it back uh, to the other material, it, uh, it, then uh, electrostatic equilibrium is going to disturb again. The charges are going to move from the bottom, instead of moving from bottom to top, and it's moved from top to bottom. Like this, when we are moving or uh, separating it's continuously, it generates uh, uh, <clears throat> electrostatic uh, charges or the electricity through the external circuit. And by moving continuously, it is going to be generated the electricity. So how to move this, uh, how to separate these two materials continuously? We are going to use some mechanical energy on top of the other material, on, on top of one of the material, uh, to make sure it could be moved very easily continuously and generates the electricity continuously. Uh, in that terms, we have used the mechanical energy uh, to uh, reduce the distance between these two materials and gives electricity continuously. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> however, um, before going to develop the travel electric generators to attain a high output performance, there is uh, notable approaches have been followed and there is must to follow the two key features of the travel generators. One is the selection of material. Uh, one material we have to choose from the most positive material and there is the most negative material. Then only we are going to get the high performance and uh, by using, uh, by, sele by selecting these materials, we can get the high performance. And so selectivity of those materials is very important to get the high performance or to convert uh, this mechanical energy efficiently into electricity. In terms of uh, solar cells, we can say, uh, efficiency can be uh, get more high when we are choosing the better materials. And the second approach is uh, the surface morphology of these materials whatever the material we have selected, the surface morphology of this material is going to be play a key role, also play a key role in increasing the performance. Uh, how it could be, when we are introducing the uh, nano or micro architecture on top of uh, uh, the surface of travel material, it could be give the high contact area between the two materials. And increasing the contact area is going to be increase the surface charge density and which results, uh, the electric output is very high. So, creating the nano or micro architectures on top of uh, one of the material or both the materials is going to be done by different te different uh, techniques like lithography and dry etching techniques. <coughs> Sorry, lithography and dry, dry etching techniques like photolithography and nano imprinting lithography, laser imprinting lithography. At the same time, uh, assembling the nano or micro architectures on top of the substrate or heating and one of the substrate like uh, gold coated uh, sapphire substrate can be e heat and uh, produce some micro or nano random architectures on top of it and producing this uh, structures we can increase surface roughness however using this lithography and dry etching techniques is going to be increase uh, the cost of travel generators at the same time it's going to be a time consuming so in order to uh, reduce the cost of travel generators uh, and to make the travel generator easily available for everyone, uh, we have to follow uh, the easy techniques or uh, the cost-effective techniques instead of following uh, all the laboratory uh, techniques like in, uh, lithography and dry etching and all. So <clears throat> we have uh, followed uh, certain techniques like the motivation of our work is to use them textiles and the processing molds, which can be easily made with the cost-effective technique process and bio-waste materials. First of all, textiles is going to be easily available at 
in particular, we have used the worn out textiles, whatever the textiles is uh, used uh, for several months or several years, then those textiles we have collected and we have uh, used it to develop nanometers. Using these textiles can be reduce the cost at the same time, uh, the fibrous stretches on top of textiles, like it's made up of the fibers, these fibrous stretches can uh, give the micro pattern, as we have discussed, Mm -hmm. Micro patterns on top of trabeolitic nanometers is an advantageous to increase the surface charge density. So, using the uh, textiles itself is going to be used uh, as a micro pattern uh, substrate or trabeolitic material, and it can be expected to increase the surface charge density. At the same time, uh, the flexibility of the textiles is very high, and uh, it's easy to wear, and it's uh, even it's washable. If when it is very flexible and easy to wear, whenever we wear the cloth and when we move our hand or when we move our leg, it's going to be easily um, uh, grab or gather that mechanical energy and convert it into electricity. And, and secondly, we have used the silicon, micro pattern silicon or anodic aluminum oxides. This can be done by the chemical, uh, easy chemical process, like, uh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> like anodization and uh, uh, chemical treatment like with uh, chemical etching techniques and these are very fast and uh, simple too. Finally, we have also used the bio waste material like uh, waste cotton. We have used it and we further refined and make the travel material at the same time. We have collected the waste cocoons. Of course, uh, cocoons are going to be, silk cocoons are going to be used for the silk industry to make the silk saddies and all. But we have collected uh, the waste cocoons, which are not useful even for uh, the farmers as well as the silk industry. Those uh, cocoons we have collected and refined those cocoons and make the triboelectric films and use those as in uh, uh, to harvest the mechanical energies. Moreover, it's going to be biocompatible. It can be easily fixed on top of the skin. It cannot hurt your skin even. And uh, it could be also in implant in our body systems like uh, to harvest the um, uh, internal organ system uh, energy also. So first, uh, we will discuss about the textiles, how we have developed the, the textile-based tribulate nanometers. We use uh, the worn-out lab coat and we diced, uh, we cut into the pieces and further we grow some conducting polymer on top of this uh, textile. By using the simple technique like uh, dipping into the polymerization sol solution, and let it be uh, grow for 20 hours like that. And then it's grow very easily at very low temperatures. And this textiles is further used uh, to make the travel nanometers. And even it could be washable and it's mechanically sustainable too. Uh, what we have did is one material, uh, one textile is used as a top uh, travel electric material and it's used as an electrode as well as the travel electric material. And the bottom, we have used uh, another textile here it is going to use only the uh, electrode and the, another negative tribal electric metal we have chosen, which can have the ability to grab the electrons very easily. And that used as a negative tribal electric metal. And when we bring the textile near to the PTFE, it's called PTFE, negative tribal electric metal. When we bring the textile near to the PTFE, it simply uh, gives some electron to the PTFE due to its uh, high uh, tendency to, to give the electrons. So like that, we generate the electricity. <clears throat> and here is the polymer, what we have grown on top of the textile fiber is each fiber before uh, the growth of polymer on top of conductive polymer on top of it and after growing it. And further, we have studied the mechanical durability of the textile, the honey growed uh, textile. When we are um, keeping that into several, uh, uh, several rolling and folding uh, and squeezing and bending, uh, we have, keep in the mechanical deformation, several mechanical deformation. It gives the resistance or the conductivity is same. And moreover, the performance of uh, the nanometers we have observed is about uh, 350 uh, volts and uh, the current is about 40 micro ampere. <clears throat> and it gives the power density is very high, like about 11.25 uh, volt per meter square. And it's for the gathered power is further supplied to electronic displays as well as to LEDs connected in series. And when we are uh, supplying this energy uh, to the displays, it's continuously charged and discharged can be observed. 
and it gives uh, you know, the displays to blow for a longer time. <clears throat> and next is uh, we have used this textile as a single electrode tool for variable applications. Like when we are using this electrode uh, <clears throat> as a positive material, and another is the negative material. Uh, when we have fixed this uh, textile on top of our shirt, when we are leaning on the chair, usually most of the chairs are the you know, fiber type, like the plastic chairs. When we are sitting or uh, the leaning on the chair, the electricity is generated about uh, 40 or 20, 30 volts. And this uh, electricity is for the, sorry, this electricity is for the use to generate, uh, uh, use to uh, power for the displays and all. See, when we are leaning and uh, saying for it is not able to display the mm -hmm. video. <clears throat> yeah, here it is. When we are leaning on top of the chair and sitting on top of the chair, it easily generates the electricity. And moreover, uh, we fix one textile on top of uh, on top of shirt, uh, just near to our hand. Uh, like uh, when we are moving uh, the hand on top of the shirt, it can easily generate the electricity. And it gives about two micro and uh, Ampere and as well as the uh, 30 or 40 volts. So, <clears throat> these textiles can be uh, used to develop uh, the traveling nanometers and can be harvested uh, biomechanical engines very easily. In another work, we have uh, patterned, uh, <clears throat> we have developed the micro patterns on the Teflon or it's called PTFE again. And we have developed these uh, micro patterns on the textiles and used this as a negative traveling material and the aluminum as used as a positive travel material. And we have uh, attained uh, the voltage about 200 volts and the current uh, about 10 micro ampere. And we have further used this uh, again into power the displays <clears throat> and harvested the energy uh, from the foot movement as well as the falling objects. Uh, like uh, we have obtained the power density of 18 watt per meter square and the more advantage of uh, this nanometer is it could be harvest uh, the step movement. For example, when the person is going to enter your house, it could be harvest that person's foot movement and then it can be converted into the electricity and that electricity can be make your sensors fixed in your home can be work and that gives a signal that somebody entering your house. At the same time, uh, the falling object. Uh, for example, if we observe some earthquakes uh, in uh, small scale, not a high scale, if it is uh, some small scale, we can detect uh, what is that uh, earthquake frequency and all uh, by using the objects which are going to fall in your home on top of the floor. So this annotator can be fixed on the floors and can be harvest your foot movement as well as the object falling movements. <clears throat> And final, and next thing we have uh, used the AAO as I have mentioned is anodic aluminum oxide is used as a mold to pattern the PDMS and that PDMS have been used and uh, we made some uh, <clears throat> nice uh, stretcher uh, of um, windmill uh, using uh, the waste plastic bottles and those plastic bottles used to harvest the uh, wind energy, whatever we have observed in our homes or on top of our roof and all. And when we are moving uh, uh, in the air uh, environment, it could be harvested using these plastic bottles. And this wind energy convert into uh, the mechanical force. And this mechanical force can be, means using the wind energy, it can be rotate the mechanical uh, um, cam or it's called uh, nose cam. Uh, <clears throat> when it is rotating, it can be uh, it can be apply some force on top of the nanometer, so it can be generate uh, electricity. Of course, I have a video you can uh, see that. And here we have obtained the power density is about uh, seven watt per meter square, and uh, uh, voltage about uh, six eighty two volt and forty two point five micro ampere. However, in this study, uh, we have developed a simulation technique, which is uh, for the first time we have developed, it's calculated the stress analysis across the materials. When we are applying the force, how much stress is going to be appear or going to be uh, distributed on top of this nanostructures. How this stretch, uh, how this stress is going to be influenced, the performance of nanometer is studied in this work. <clears throat> so based on the theoretical simulations, we have observed the contact area 
is going to be uh, convert into the uh, surface charge density how much force is going to apply on micro pillars or the nano pillars and how much is efficiently convert into mechanical energy into electricity uh, so <clears throat> finally we have used this nanometer if you see the demonstrations of uh, nanometers we have uh, um, blow some air on top of uh, this windmill and it's convert into mechanical energy and it's continuously uh, rotating uh, the um, cam on top of the nanometers and is applying some force at the same time if you see uh, we have kept this nanometer on top of the roof and we not applied any force or the wind force on top of the windmill and it's continuously generating the electricity at the same time if we have fixed the uh, prototype nanometers or windmills on top of the car front side when we are uh, moving on the car it uh, the wind energy converted into electricity and it gives uh, a certain voltage it's uh, at certain speed of the car we have noted the car speed and we calculated how much uh, voltage is gathering by the car, car speed and if we increase the car speed how it is going to be increase or decrease uh, those studies are so performed in this work <coughs> and uh, finally uh, we have used the biocompatible materials like as i mentioned we have used the textiles at the same time the pattern substrate um, to study how the mechanical forces or the mechanical uh, distributions on the surface is going to be converted how it is going to influence and we have developed the wind mills as well as uh, we have <clears throat> developed uh, uh, the flows uh, which can be convert the footsteps and uh, the falling of the object into electricity uh, so at the same time finally we have used the biodegradable material like a silk which can be uh, cut into um, the several pieces and it's make a polymer using the several chemical uh, processes and that polymer is uh, used as an triboelectric positive material and the ptfe uh, have used as a negative triboelectric material uh, in the most of our work we have used the ptfe as a negative triboelectric material because it have an ability to uh, grab the electrons very easily and it is uh, noted as a best triboelectric negative material so Uh, we have used the silk as a silk filling as a positive material, and we have uh, used that to uh, convert into electricity. Uh, at the same time, what we have performed is uh, uh, the novelty of this work is we have treated this silk filling with the alkyl alkali treatment. Means uh, we used uh, some alkali treatment uh, to make this the robust and it can be sustained in humid environment too. Uh, for example if we see the first uh, four images here we not perform any alcohol treatment to the silk it degraded within uh, the three minutes when we treated with the alcohol it sustained uh, more than the 24 hours it even sustained for the several days so in humid environment it can be sustained very easily and it can be continuously convert uh, the mechanical energy into electricity uh most important factor of the travel nanometers or the most important feature of the travel nanometers is to be sustained at the humid environment because the humidity can highly influence the travel performance uh, highly influence the performance of travel nanometers so uh, we have to make the material which should be withstand at the humidity <clears throat> and uh, by using the humid and uh, humidity sustained material we have Uh, obtain uh, the performance is consistent even for 30 days and we have uh, i'm i didn't keep the data here but we have uh, keep this for 3 months in outdoor environment and then we have checked the performance of the travel nanometer is almost uh, stable around 350 volts <clears throat> and this uh, power this electricity is further used to uh, generate the leds as well as the displays <clears throat> and Here is uh, we have used this nanometers to make a flexible nanometer and to convert the different types of uh, movements like uh, uh, when we are pushing with the finger or we, by folding uh, our hand we have uh, placed the nanometer on top of the hand uh, elbow on top of the elbow of the hand and then we when we move the hand it uh, harvested or it can sense that uh, movement in in terms of say saying uh, harvesting it could be used as a sensor. it could be used to sense that movements of your hand as well as uh, we have uh, placed on this hand and when we are uh, pushing 
uh, folding the hand, it can harvest uh, and it can sense how uh, how the efficiency, how the uh, force is applying on your hand. And moreover, means furthermore, uh, <clears throat> we have even sensed the stress level. Uh, usually, we use the stress ball when we feel very stress. We used to press that ball uh, for uh, to reduce our stress. So. Um, based on uh, using this nanometer, we can even calculate uh, how much uh, stress is the human is feeling. For example, if he is pushing very hardly, the force is going to act on nanometer is going to be very high. It gives the pressure or the voltage is going to be very high. In terms of voltage, we are going to measure the pressure apply on the ball. If uh, the person's uh, uh, mental tension or the mental ability is very less, or this intention is very less, is going to uh, push it very slowly. So uh, the voltage is going to very less and then we can uh, calculate or the sense that moment even. And finally, we have uh, calculated, uh, we have um, sensed the moment of your uh, leg and uh, uh, your hand, how much angle you have folded it. Like uh, when you are sitting, you are going to fold about uh, <clears throat> 180 degree, um, uh, 45 degree, how you when you're walking, it is 45 degree, and when you're standing, it is zero degree, like that. Uh, how much uh, your leg is folded, and how much your hand is folded, and further, we can also convert uh, or sense uh, while you're walking, running, or jumping. In terms of voltage, we can convert uh, that what you're doing, what is your activity, and at the same time, punching uh, the boxing. Uh, bag is also can be uh, calculated or uh, the sense by the nanometer and it could be give in terms of voltage what the activity is done by the human <clears throat> and here is uh, the just demonstrations of um, the nanometers what we have used here is at very low stress we are able to get the voltage is very less and uh, that can be identified as a low stress level of the humans or the persons who is uh, pushing the ball and further if uh, he's uh, feeling very high stress, it's going to be increase. It's going to be increase the stress level or the pushing force on top of the ball. And finally, uh, uh, at very high force, uh, it's going to be continuously pushed, and the voltage is going to increase. Uh, at the same time, as I have um, explained in the figures, uh, the demonstration we have done is uh, touching uh, <clears throat> the device and folding the arm, as well as uh, to. Um, folding your um, this um, <clears throat> hand also and uh, it's called optimizer and we are folding the leg even if we uh, keep it on top of knee uh, and when we are folding the leg also we can calculate the angle and uh, and finally uh, we have also used uh, the cotton uh, refined cotton and it's uh, converted into cellulose particles those cellulose particles dispersed into uh, the polymers and we have in this work we have used we have made a coin type cell and which can be easily uh, fixed in your um, in the gap of your leg like in the usually bone structure of your our uh, leg is going to be like this and this is the gap of uh, our leg and we made the coin cell to make sure it could be fixed in this gap and when we are walking our uh, bone movement is going to be changed uh, so these movements can be also harvested uh, while we are walking <clears throat> and we harvest uh, those energies and convert uh, the most of walking, running and jumping into electricity very easily. And moreover, using this type of coin cell structure, we have uh, <clears throat> get the performance consistently even in the modern environment because by packing uh, this um, nanometer into coin type cell, the humidity is cannot be go inside and it cannot affect your performance of your nanometer. And even if we fix in the leg, uh, usually most of the people can uh, sweat inside our shoe. So this sweat can also influence uh, nanometer. So uh, to prevent that uh, uh, sweat, to influence the nanometer performance, we have packed very tightly and uh, it, coin cell can be harvested very easily and convert this electricity, sorry, convert this mechanical energy into electricity. Uh, very easily and uh, gives uh, the output uh, voltage and current. And finally, uh, sorry, I think this is the final work. Uh, we have made uh, another type of pouch type uh, device. And what we have did is we uh, pack like a batteries 
and if you see uh, <clears throat> if you see here uh, there are some um, uh, water droplets uh, is accumulating on top of uh, the surface of pouch type nanometer and this uh, water droplets is uh, not entering inside and these are going to be stopped by uh, the outer cover and it can be gives the consistency performance and it gives a uh, good output electricity and moreover uh, it could be fixed in any of your bags and uh, any of some what we are carrying uh, here we have this uh, pouch type device into bag and when we are walking by taking the movement of your bag on top of your body is also um, can be work <clears throat> so uh, along with that we have uh, performed some other sensing uh, uh, the harvesting ability of uh, our nanometers like uh, we have used to some, uh, sense the different movements like uh, using uh, the folding and and uh, walking as i have discussed and at the same time recently we have developed a nanometer which can be fixed on top of uh, our wearables like belt and when we are walking uh, our movement of hand can be also uh, convert this electricity into um, uh, you know, convert this mechanical energy into electricity and finally we have also used this nanometer to harvest uh, um, the motions of vehicles by moving the vehicles and we can uh, take that energy means when the vehicles are moving on the road uh, there is a friction between the road and uh, tires can be observed those friction or the mechanical forces can be also converted into the electricity using this nanometers uh, and simply says wherever the friction or the mechanical forces is observed uh, that forces or uh, the energy is going to be converted into electricity using uh, this nanometers and which are a more efficient to supply for uh, the ai systems <clears throat> and finally uh, we have uh, demonstrated a and combined device like we have combined solar cell and nanometers and convert uh, this uh, uh, device the combined device can be convert uh, either simultaneously or continuously can convert the mechanical energy as well as solar energy into electricity and it can be uh, supply uh, to air systems here if you see we made the four ds dyson set solar cells and then we have um, aligned one triboelectric nanometer on top of it and then we are applying a force on top of it as well as the light on top of the combined device uh, it's called hybrid device it can give uh, the voltage either for example here we have observed um, the voltage is very high if it is only solar energy in the first case we have observed only solar energy it gives around 2 volt when we uh, apply solar as well as the mechanical it gives very high and third case we have applied solar and the wind energy then it gives around uh, 12 volt so instead of gathering only the mechanical energy or the solar energy separately if we combine the both we can um, harvest using hybrid cell we can harvest very uh, means we can harvest the multiple energies and we can get the more electricity and it can be uh, supply for ai systems <clears throat> so here is the conclusions uh, as i have uh, discussed in, the, in my talk we have used the textiles as well as pattern uh, substrate uh, to convert uh, the wind energy and the footfall moment and uh, the object falling as well as the moment of your bag which is uh, uh, on your back <clears throat> and at the same time we can attain uh, the good consistent performance even in in the humid environment and finally we have used the bio materials also the bio waste materials also to convert into the electricity and which can be uh, easily gather uh, the mechanical energies and very easily degradable its main uh, important factor it could be eco friendly and it can be easily degradable and finally combining uh, the both uh, type of devices like uh, mechanical harvesting device uh, and uh, solar harvesting device we can get the energy or simultaneously or uh, uh, gather the both the energy instead of gathering Uh, separate uh, using the separate devices to gather the separate energies <clears throat> yeah thank you for hi dr vidya uh, thank you dr baskar uh, you have few questions in the chat box um, could sure. you please uh, say there's one question yeah. uh, how much of voltage we will get 
are we able to use directly to other appliances yeah this is uh, good actually we, as i have shown uh, based on the device type we can uh, get the different uh, uh, voltage and currents uh, so okay. uh usually this voltage and currents are the alternating uh, signals so it could it cannot be directly applied to uh, other uh, systems ai systems it could be uh, convert into dc using uh, uh, using uh, the <clears throat> sorry using the uh, external um, elements like uh, we use a uh, um, western bridge uh, to convert those uh, ac signal into dc and those can be stored into supercapacitor and then further it can be supplied to a displays it could be done but not directly it could be converted into dc and moreover recently uh, we have seen one research they have uh, used this traveler commutators to directly get the dc current okay. and that research is ongoing right at this moment it could be done in future uh, it okay. could be directly uh, get the dc current and it could be directly uh, applied to all, uh, all the ai systems too Okay, I believe someone will pick up from here and proceed towards uh, the actual uh, application of what we discussed right now. Uh, there's oh, okay. one more question: uh, Can we use these for rehabilitation? Uh, can you give a gist? I think we can use it for rehabilitation because uh, it's a recent research area. Okay. Uh, so it is continuously developing. Now we have reached uh, until the high power and getting uh, the. Uh, very easy um, from the moments where we can very easily get uh, the electricity but okay. in future uh, when we get the dc directly it could be use useful uh, for several purposes okay. it could be in future okay uh, thank you sir uh, are there any points that you would add uh, for the graduates here uh, for the funding yeah. opportunities in this field of graphene in your university mm, actually uh, uh, in india this uh, field is uh, now introduced i think uh, recently introduced okay. uh, but uh, in uk also the same thing this research area is very new to uh, uk most of the people are the most of uh, researcher from usa and asia is a focus on this research area so in terms of funding uh, first of all uh, conducting this conference uh, and uh, giving knowledge to graduate students is very good uh, thing and uh, i think uh, the ability to get the funding for the graduate student could be increase in uk too but in usa especially in this field we have much opportunities in usa uh, recently in uk is also developing more uh, so uh, the base fund of uh, this nanometers is to harvest simply harvest uh, the mechanical energies using the simple materials uh, even nowadays people are using the graphene type so there is the possibility to get the more fund uh, using uh, this nanometers because it is very new research and focusing on this instead of focusing on only nanometers combining the devices with the nanometers with other devices like as i have mentioned in the last work if we combine with the uh, solar cells or with uh, some other things we can easily uh, uh, get more good funds Okay. I hope. Okay. So, um, can I have another question? There's one more. Yeah, sure, 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 please. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, where is uh, tank produced in more numbers? In terms of numbers, we cannot yeah. uh, easily say, but uh, okay. uh, tank is can be used in any type of uh, application. Like even if we use uh, uh, in numbers. Oh, uh, I think. I'm sorry. Uh, I think the question is about produced. Where is it produced in more numbers? In more numbers. Yeah. I didn't get that. Okay. Okay. So maybe that could be browsed, right? So yeah, let's see. Yeah. Okay. In numbers, uh, thank you. I don't understand what is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you any so much. Uh, uh, any other questions? Um. I don't understand this question. Who's this? Uh, what is the other side of the sensor? In the sense? Sensor. Actually, what is the other uh, side? <laughs> actually, I this don't... is uh, could be used as a sensor, but okay. uh, other side of sensor it could be harvest. I think simply saying. Okay. <laughs> oh, sensor disposal. 
sensor okay. disposal actually yeah. um, we cannot compare uh, exactly how uh, it is sensor and nanometers but okay. nanometers can be used as sensors at the okay. same time can harvest the energy a disposal okay. purpose it could be easily disposed and uh, most of the materials used in nanometers is eco friendly so it could be easily disposed in terms of sensors we use uh, uh some most of the metallic uh, material means like uh, metallic rich materials like uh, some uh, dangerous materials we use to make sensors which could okay. uh, sometimes which could tend to be easily disposed but fabric nanometers is mostly disposable okay oh so that's a good very good uh, piece of information sir uh, i thank you very much for walking us through the micro and the nano architecture of pen and a yeah. lot of introduction about the graphene and um, how about its applications characterization techniques yeah, and so, sorry sorry yeah. to interrupt you but uh, we have used the polyaniline not the graphene polyaniline is it yeah yes, okay yes it's the conducting polymer of okay. course we are using the graphene also but in future yeah the, that was the introduction that, yeah that work is going on yeah yeah yes. the introduction uh, was there okay so uh, i also thank you for uh, giving inputs about the funding opportunities available thank you yeah. so much yeah. thank you thank you very much yes sir yeah so um we are here uh, with the last part of the conference uh, i now invite uh, dr darni bai the convener to deliver the conclusion remarks डॉक्टर धर्मी बाई good evening uh, good evening all good evening ma'am uh, uh, dear guest uh, ladies and gentlemen we have uh, come to the uh, last session the conclusion and uh, we have reached this uh, two days international conversation uh, conference which i hope it is very informative uh, and i would like to express my heartfelt thanks to each one of you for participating in this uh, conference uh, this uh, i I'll, i'll just uh, put my summary about this conference the inaugural session was uh, graced by the presence of our beloved chancellor dr g viswanathan who enlightened the the view uh, towards technology and its uh, current proliferation in the community our vice chancellor dr s narayan highlighted the credentials of vit and made all of us proud for being part of uh, the prestigious university our vice president mr sankar rasanathan he felicitated the event and our conference chair dr harish kitur uh, 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 was with us uh, felicitating the technical advisory committee dr alex uh, zakaria dr elizabeth rupes and mr ganga gopal our speakers organizers and uh, other participants gathered here to witness the happening i would like to conclude with a few thoughts on what we have learned uh, uh, during these two days Uh, first message by uh, our chief guest uh, dr M mr anil kumar muniswami uh, who was loud and clear for us uh, uh, he gave a clear industry perspective uh, discussion he insisted in using numbers in uh, predicting what would be in use in the next 10 years in the wearable technology field he questioned us with uh, what it will all mean to us of course the answer he tried to convince uh, us were uh, very informative he highlighted about the shirts with embedded chips smart uh, earrings shoes etc which could uh, generate energy for the device and as well uh, give details about the vitals of the body he also said uh, that he is encouraged that uh, the technology of wearables and uh, 5g are taking uh, great strides to do it 1 million dollars technology is expected from the opportunities involving uh, 5g and uh, wearable technology 
and session one where we had a talk on the topic uh, wearable technologies in medical applications uh, uh, dr mohan kumar the country head uh, for wearable technologies india he gave us a, a chance to explore how wearable technologies are becoming an integral part of the healthcare delivery uh, delivery systems and uh, personalized uh, personalized medical uh, medicine globally he talked uh, uh, about his talk started with uh, emerging global opportunities that were available for india in the wearable space especially in the post covid 19 scenario and how we can leverage our uh, academic and uh, industrial ecosystems to capture a significant market share with covid 19 uh, bringing the healthcare system uh, to the verge of collapse a paradigm shift towards remote healthcare system is fast emerging and that uh, and uh, his talk then uh, covered the basics of uh, medical uh, device design uh, with some real life examples and uh, it converged on to illustrations of emerging product offerings and the talk concluded with some uh, business innovations uh, that are needed to improve uh, market accessibility uh, and stickiness of wearable products so be it in the medical space or otherwise session 2 uh, the talk was about the recent trends in cloud computing and data analytics the principal architect iot uh, from tcs uh, mr dakshinamurthy he touched upon how a perfect uh, storm of societal industry and technology trends is driving transformational change he covered the trends across compute materials robotics security manufacturing life science societal behavior and the technology driving the change uh, he mentioned the trends impacting variables cloud and analytics also he also described the architecture patterns in the cloud and closed out the, the talk with how variables and applications are helping people and organizations during the covid uh, recovery session 3 is about wearable technology it's rapidly changing landscape and excellence uh, uh, mr arun vaidyanathan uh, director of engineering and excellence he reminded us about uh, how the sensory motion tracking enabled uh, by smart sensors is at the forefront of uh, our fourth uh, industrial age uh, pushing the boundaries of ai and ml uh, further than uh, what we could have imagined he emphasized that uh, elite athletes now uh, use motion sensors to enhance uh, their performance and uh, the sports enthusiast uh, to improve their uh, tennis serve or the goal sing uh, he discussed on points related to the healthcare where motion tracking is helping people to monitor their heart rates sleep patterns and fitness fitness levels and how uh, this uh, technology is opening the possibilities for entrepreneurs and the innovators to transform their own industries he concluded with a remark uh, uh, that our physical biological and technological uh, worlds are merging like uh, never before and the potential of the wearable technologies only restricted by the extent of our imagination session 4 we had a talk on uh, wearable devices for robotics motion capture uh, by mr prabhajana rao uh, the CV, ceo of uh, galor systems bangalore uh, he presented uh, uh, the talk about uh, motion capture technology as a critical component uh, of autonomous robotics uh, design the focus was on uh, initial motion capture technology a full picture of uh, some uh, practical pipeline for the robotics manipulation using uh, mocap was provided uh, including the basic demo of uh, motion tracking using xsense and the manus mocap products the participants were engulfed into the uh, technical show of the mocap uh, uh, products session 5 uh, is about uh, iot its usage uh, and future targeting the wearables uh, mr nitin avasti the director of axis solutions introduced the world of iot related wearables and product design in iot space to the audience uh, he spoke about uh, the working of uh, the most common wearables in like google glass fitbit and the technical learnings he also threw light on the uh, do it yourself uh, uh, of uh, projects in the wearables uh, mr nitin avasti explained the flow of product design and idea generation to iot plus uh, wearables and he urged the students to take up uh, entrepreneurship uh, uh, come up with the concepts and bring them out uh, into the market his vision included to make indian economy strong with the tag made in india going strong session 4 on iot uh, uh, data management and analytics being a professor department of uh, decision and information sciences dr vijayan sukumaran opened the views about how the wearable technologies are proliferating and are providing innovative solutions for healthcare problems the uh, he projected that the data is growing exponentially due to the popularity of wearable devices managing and analyzing this data will become a challenge due to the personal data explosion 
and require efficient data storage and management methods. He focused on the issues related to the management and analysis of this uh, sensitive uh, personal data and the role of big data tools and uh, techniques as well as the artificial intelligence were highlighted in uh, analyzing and uh, supporting the clinical decision making. Session seven uh, uh, was on the topic uh, wearable biosensors, a MEMS perspective. Uh, professor at the School of Medical Science and Technology, IIT Karakpur, Dr. Soman Das, enumerated about uh, the recent advancement in medical technology and about uh, how significant improvements uh, in healthcare has uh, increased life expectancy. However, this is like uh, cancer, diabetes, heart attack, etc. Accounts for majority of deaths around the globe, mostly in uh, dense populated countries. He highlighted that uh, various miniature commercial devices are available for clinical purposes with superior quality, sensitivity, specificity, with rapid uh, turnaround time for disease analysis, user-friendly, economic, and portable. A broad picture was uh, given on uh, appreciation of the phenomenal success of uh, computer industry and information uh, technology that is attributed for the constant downsizing of the CMOS devices and circuitry for the electrical signal processing with reduced cost, faster and denser systems with less power consumption and enhanced functionality in this perspective. He highlighted the uh, development of uh, miniature biomems devices for diverse applications towards fast and affordable uh, diagnostic uh, process. And few examples of uh, polymer-based flexible biosensors were uh, cited uh, for detection of biomedical signals in uh, catheterization process uh, uh, for the precise diagnosis and uh, therapeutics. Session eight was on the topic, uh, tribalectric nanogenerators for wearable and portable uh, electronics by Dr. Vivekanda Venkateshwaran from Jeju University, South Korea. He said that portable and wearable electronics are becoming most attractive and uh, trending in the society and uh, creating positive influence among the people. He emphasized on the nanogenerators such as tribalectric nanogenerator and uh, piezoelectric nanogenerator, which gave a potential to use as a promising power source replacing the battery. Uh, with the reduction in the size, nano generators can be used to harvest energy for the human body motions, such as muscular movements, vibrations from the body activity, and eventually be used to, to power the wearable electronic devices. Um, he enlists some advantages of gathering the high output, easy fabrication, cost effectiveness of these devices. Uh, session nine was on uh, flexible and uh, hybrid electronics applications and future by Dr. Uh, Bindu Salim, professor. Uh, from PSG uh, Institute of Advanced Sciences. Uh, her talk impressed uh, the participants by introducing the discovery of uh, conducting organic materials that has made a transition in the device technology from uh, uh, confining to be conventional silicon technology. And she labored the point that uh, solution processing of organic uh, conducting and semiconductor materials has made a breakthrough in the uh, fabrication of the electronic devices the challenges faced by the manufacturing industries in terms of the technology scaling, design rules, yield, and uh, design for manufacturing and factory integration were discussed. Uh, the concluded, uh, she concluded uh, making uh, a remark that uh, flexible hybrid electronics has made a new genesis in the electronic industry. The applications and the future of the flexible hybrid electronics were discussed. In session 10, uh, the topic was about graphene, a 2D material uh, for gas and biosensing applications by um, Dr. Rakesh Kumar Gupta, the co-founder and uh, of Ripton Limited uh, uh, from Michigan University. He focused primarily on the first 2D material that is graphene and the superlative properties, graphene synthesis methods, characterization techniques, and its application in electronic gas and biosensors. He also introduced the audience briefly with the birthplace of uh, graphene, that is the University of Manchester, where the pioneer work of graphene isolation was performed. Lastly, Dr. Rakesh uh, shed the light on various uh, funding schemes for graduate and postgraduate students to acquire higher studies and uh, research opp opportunities in the field of uh, graphene at the University of Manchester or uh, in other uh, institutions in the UK. Uh, session 11 is about uh, robust, flexible, and uh, humid resistant uh, tribalary nanogenerators for uh, harnessing biomedical uh, energies by Dr. Basker Dudam. Uh, he asserted that, uh, uh, that energy uh, harnessing from uh, natural resources such as solar, wind, geothermal, and uh, mechanical energies are emerging research areas to fulfill the uh, globally rising uh, energy demanding uh, owing to the enormous usage of various electronic systems. He pinpointed that the tribal electric nanogenerators 
uh, attain a huge interest owing to their ability to convert ambient uh, mechanical energies into the electricity, as well as hold great potential applications as uh, self-powered uh, wearable sensors. He highlighted uh, uh, the development of uh, uh, tripolar nano generators using the flexible, uh, cost-effective bio waste and how eco-friendly uh, materials can be employed to sense or harvest the human body motions and uh, moderate uh, uh, wind flows. He concluded that uh, the uh, tripolar nano generators are either developed with the super hydrophobic uh, materials or entirely enveloped with an uh, appropriate outer cover to protect it uh, uh, from the humid uh, environment and uh, attain a stable electrical output performance. In conclusion, as with all such events, and this conference has been an outstanding example, our minds have been uh, assailed by the torrent of ideas, uh, information, statistics, interpretations and visions, implementations, and it will probably be a day or two uh, before we can shift through uh, them all, uh, consolidate our own personal perspectives. There is indeed plenty to reflect uh, upon, and if this is in any way uh, enhances our individual and collective contributions to meeting the global technical challenges, then the conference can truly be the, uh, the success. So to conclude, uh, let me just say that uh, we seek uh, to innovate uh, uh, the wearable technology and to listen uh, what the users need and uh, uh, to better serve our communities and adapt the technology to the growing uh, digital age. So uh, this is the summary of our conference. Uh, thank you. And it, it is uh, uh, very uh, uh, happy that uh, we received 900 partic uh, participants from over 247 organizations from uh, 13 countries. And uh, I hope uh, this conference uh, shed some light on the emerging uh, uh, area, this uh, thrust area, and uh, hope all of you have benefited. Thank you again. Uh, over to Vidya, uh, uh, if, uh, about this conference, uh, thank you, you ma'am. Uh, I you. now request uh, Mr. Uh, Ganga Gopal, uh, the team uh, of uh, advisory committee, to deliver his valuable words during the conclusion. Please, sir. Uh, uh, can you, uh, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, good evening, one and all. Uh, this is uh, Gangatharan Gopal. Uh, I work for a company called Excense Technologies. Uh, we are a California-based fabulous semiconductor company and having the design centers in Enschede, Netherlands, and also in Asia Pacific, we have in Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Bangalore, uh, covering this uh, entire Asia Pacific region. So I'm uh, permit pleased to be part of this event. And I've been you know, uh, watching uh, these two days, uh, the complete sessions, uh, speakers from all over the world uh, presenting. And I believe this is one of the, you know, uh, very uh, the professional as well as, you know, successful uh, uh, virtual conference. Uh, I've been seeing this in the last three months uh, by an institute, uh, which is very famous. Uh, you know, I would say not only in India, all over the world, you know, VIT. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Dr. Alex and Darani Boy and the entire team of VIT uh, to, to have Excellence be part of this event. And uh, also, I would like to just highlight some of those points on the wearable technologies, what Excellence is supporting so that it will be very useful for those attendees as well as those uh, research students, you know, uh, from your college as well as uh, from the industry people, right? So if you look at excess like companies, excess is not the only one. Of course, excess is uh, 20 years in the business of uh, wearable sensors and technology. Uh, these uh, markets, if you look at it for wearable technologies, uh, every day it is exponentially growing. Uh, there are two major you know, uh, area we see uh, the growth uh, coming from. One is the inertial sensor modules, whatever we call the ISM modules, which are predominantly used these days in design such as uh, autonomous driving, selfless uh, you know driving it is, whether it is a car design or truck design or port vehicles uh, you know autonomous driving is one of the major area another one what we see is a robotics uh, robotics being it is in logistic warehousing like flipkart like companies who are having their warehouses where people wanted to have these uh, autonomous uh, agvs they call uh, automatic guided vehicles or autonomous guided vehicles so all the robotics are autonomous mobile robotics being used in the factory and production environment for pick and place and also you know, uh, move the goods around the production lines. So we have been selling these in a lot of automotive uh, companies, automotive production houses, 
in India and also in my region, Southeast Asia. So these are all some of the area where inertial sensor modules are being used. Another area I think most of the speaker were talking about is basically the uh, you know uh, complete uh, body wearable, biomechanical wearable systems. We call, again, two major areas. One is the human motion measurement systems, uh, which are you know, uh, biomechanical you know, sensors. So these are all the DRDO labs and private you know, healthcare medical companies. They use these uh, human body wearable systems, which are predominantly used for uh, ergonomics analysis, rehabilitation, sports science and sports medicine. And also people use it in multiple different production environments where they want to measure the workers' productivity and also their fatigue level. So this is one area where there are a lot of growth we see. The second major one is in the live entertainment, filming, animation, and game development area, what we call as a 3D character animation. Uh, this is starting from the Hollywood to Bollywood, and also there are multiple different game development studios to offline and also online you know, uh, studios. Uh, people use it, and people also use these for uh, live entertainment. So last night in the US, uh, John Legend, who is one of the famous uh, musician in the US, he used our Exxon's uh, whole body suit, uh, sitting at his home, but he, he did a complete live concert where millions of people all over the world, they have seen. Just this morning, it was published in the YouTube video, I've been forwarding. So he's having our Exxon's whole body sensor suit, uh, sitting at his home studio, and then he's just you know doing a live concert you know, with his own you know, character, virtually created, and then you know, performing. So there are a lot of you know uh, such things happening uh, in even uh, India and also you know uh, the surrounding uh, Southeast Asia regions where we have been supporting. I'm sure you know a lot of uh, research students and also the industry uh, can adopt these kind of wearables and new technologies. We are there to support you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, I now invite uh, our uh, cha uh, chairman for the conference, uh, Dr. Harish Kittu, our dean to uh, deliver a few words about uh, the conference. Yeah, thank you, Vidya. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so first of all, to start with, I have to uh, thank the management and the administration of EIT for having motivated us and supported us uh, to conduct this uh, conference even this, during these times. They, they were really at the back of it and they motivated us to, to, to come up. They came up with the idea of uh, uh, conducting such a conference, such a virtual conference during these times, uh, during this uh, pandemic times, and they motivated us. And then I would like to thank uh, Dharni Bhai ma'am for uh, having taken the initiative of leading this conference and conducting the conference. I also uh, would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Alex for support, having supported us and the volunteers, uh, Vidya Valentina and uh, many more others uh, who are not here. I think Kapir Velan sir is here. He also has supported a lot in the conduct of this conference. Yes, so this was uh, a conference which was a, a really a grand success. More than 900 participants throughout the country and also uh, participants uh, from abroad and uh, the speakers were from, from throughout the world, USA, Korea, uh, and so on. And it was a grand success and I'm really happy with the conduct of the first version of this conference has been such a success. And uh, surely uh, considering VIT's track record, the next version will be an even bigger su success. So that uh, this note, uh, I would like to close this conference. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, uh, on behalf of International Virtual Conference, Wearable Technologies and Applications, Emerging Trends and Innovations, and the entire technical gathering present here, and on my own behalf, extend a very hearty word of thanks to all speakers for grazing your important work and sharing with us your findings and opinions today. I also extend my thanks to our university for their enormous cooperation in organization of this event. Last but not the least, I thank all the participants for being more motivated and for having made this event a success. Thank you.
Thank you, one and all. Thank you, Dr. Harish. And thank you, Dr. Jenga Goban. And thank you all. And uh, I request uh, Convener Madam to officially Sir? pause the session. Officially yeah, pause yeah. the session. <laughs> yes. yes. So I take this opportunity to thank all uh, um, the organizing committee. Uh, the pillar support is uh, Alexa and uh, uh, Mr. Ganga Gopal from Excellence. Without uh, both of them, it's not at all possible because getting the people, the eminent speakers were possible only for by these two people. They were the pillars for this. And I thank you so much, sir, for this. And we are only the executors, whatever uh, we, were, we were doing. Uh, so we, I take this opportunity to thank all uh, for the participants and who made this uh, very success. And I close this uh, conference. Thank you all, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.